I'm sure you've heard the statement, give credit where credit is due. Whenever we see something being done well, or something that's uh, being done that nobody else wants to do or likes to do, maybe something that uh, always gets done, but nobody notices until it doesn't get done. We want to give credit to the person or, or to the people who are doing it. There's a lot of that happening around here at Athens Church of Christ. On any given Sunday morning, there are all kinds of things that just get done to make sure that our worship service and Sunday school and children's church just happen. And so giving credit where credit is due, I want to thank uh, some folks. I want to thank Shirley for playing the piano and organ just about every week. I mean, I get two Sundays off per year, but I don't think Shirley has missed that many every year. And I thank Bev for filling in for Shirley on, on those occasions when she's not here. I, I thank Shirley, Patty, and Sandy for picking the music, for singing each month. I thank Patty, Joanne, and Bonnie for leading us in the singing, uh, again, just about every week. And I thank Bob and Shauna for filling in when they can. I thank Keith, Chris, Shauna, Aiden, and Jake for covering the soundboard and the computer. I thank Dick, Kathy, Bev, Linda, Sandy for preparing communion, cleaning up afterwards. I thank Chuck and Gary and Keith for teaching adult Sunday school classes and Jeff for filling in when they're not able to teach and Joanne for leading the women's Bible study. I thank Shauna and Charlotte and Kathy for teaching the kids just about every week and Pauline and Jeannie for their help when they're needed. I thank Don for mowing throughout the summer and Gary for filling in at the last minute. I thank everyone who was here that day, Chuck and Chris, Shauna, Andy, Aiden, Bob, Jeannie, Roger, Mont, Linda, Jeff, Joanne, Charlotte uh, for taking care of the shrubs and landscaping. I thank Dick for keeping the books and for saving money on expenses along with Sandy. I'll tell you, those two find bargains and places to cut pennies that you wouldn't believe. And I'll thank Sandy, not only for doing her job as the secretary, but for making up for my shortcomings when it comes to helping people, especially through our food pantry. And I thank everyone who helps by supplying food for the pantry. Chuck and Shirley, Bonnie, Mont, Linda, Eileen, Mary, Linda, Patty, Charlotte, Bev, Albert, Ida, Marilyn, Nancy, uh, and those who help out with Tuesday night meals. Bev and Mary and Roger and Chuck and Shirley and Kit, Dick and Kathy and Don and Linda, Sandy, Jeff, and there are a whole lot of others who, who don't attend our church who, who help out. So I thank everyone. I, I thank Bev and Dick, Pauline and Bill for helping with our preschool. And I thank Don, Jeff, Gary, Dick, Bill, Roger, Mont, Charlie, and Chuck for taking care of the, the different projects to keep the building and grounds in good shape. And I thank those who serve on our board, taking care of our, our business, legal and property concerns. Bill, Roger, Charlie, Lance, Don, and our elders, Albert, Chuck, Dick, Gary, and Jeff. It's a lot of names. It's a lot of work that needs to get done. And I know that there are a lot of other things that, that get done. And I know I've probably missed a few names of people who deserve credit for what they do. However, I also believe that you know, just getting credit isn't what any of these folks want or need or expect. They just want to do their part to worship and serve God, to serve other people, to do their part in our mission to make disciples. Even though I probably miss giving credit where credit is due, it's important that I do that. First of all, because it's just the right thing to do. Second, because it's, import, or it's important to give credit where credit is due because it calls attention to all the things that are important for us to do. It's a good idea to give credit to people uh, who are doing good jobs because we don't want to forget that those jobs need to be done. Last, it's important to give credit where credit is due because it calls attention to the fact that we all need to get involved and do our part. That we need each other to do the tasks of the church, to fulfill the mission of the church. This is what makes serving in the church so important. It's not just that there are jobs that got to get done 
and that we need people to get those jobs done, the important part is that these jobs are necessary for us to fulfill our mission uh, of being witnesses of Jesus, of preaching the gospel, of making disciples. It's all vitally important, and so are the people. So every individual job and every individual who does the job is in the right position to fulfill our mission. Paul uses the body as a powerful illustration of this truth for the church as the body of Christ. He writes in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 14 through 18, The body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now, this becomes especially important when the church faces hardship. When the church faces opposition and persecution, suddenly even the simple task that, that some of us might take for granted any other time or, or not necessarily consider to be uh, perhaps all that important to kingdom work, as they are tied to the church, they become pressure points of hardship for those who are doing those tasks. Even when the church is doing well and not facing opposition, when individuals within the church start to fear, experience hardships, losing a job, a broken marriage, cancer, and they can't perform the, the, the tasks that they normally take care of, the church and our mission can suffer along with them. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now that should tell us about the mindset we must have about how we serve within the church for the sake of the mission, for the sake of the body. We need to have the right mind about serving so that we might be able to deal with the hardships we face. Many times in the church, people have problems with the positions they're filling as they serve, which really re reveals the position they've, uh, that they've given serving. Having the right mind about serving relates to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, ultimately, Paul had Jesus in mind as the example for us to follow. And that's what we read in Philippians 2 verse 5. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. But Paul gives the church two other examples of men who followed Christ's example. Men who the rest of the church could watch and see Christ's example in them and perhaps be encouraged to follow. In this next section of scripture, of Philippians chapter 2, Paul names Timothy and Epaphroditus as men who were humble servants just like Jesus. Good examples for us to follow. We can follow along in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 19. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, 
who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me. To spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Again, as, as we've said throughout this series, we need to remember that Paul was writing from prison because of his faith in Christ, because he was preaching the gospel, Paul was imprisoned. So the church in Philippi sent Epaphroditus to Paul with a gift and to help him. Unfortunately, it seems that Epaphroditus himself became sick, whether from his travels or from his work or from sharing in Paul's suffering, and he almost died. Despite his own hardship, Despite the hardship that Epaphroditus was experiencing with him, Paul found joy in his humble service. And he commended Epaphroditus to the Philippians as an example to follow. Paul also commended Timothy, whom Paul referred to as his true son in the faith, uh, to the Philippians. Not, not just because they needed his help, but because they knew and trusted him as a humble servant. And again... Paul wanted the church to follow Timothy's example. Now here in these few verses, Paul holds up Timothy and Epaphroditus as examples of humble servants. And we can learn from their example as well. Through Paul's commendation of, of Timothy and Epaphroditus, we can see how we can serve humbly no matter what. Paul begins his description of Timothy's model of humble service uh, there in Philippians 2 verse 20. He says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. If we're going to develop an attitude of humble service like Jesus, like Timothy's, we need to be genuine in our concern for the welfare of others. Paul gives Timothy the highest praise in this. There's no one else like him, he writes. It's a give credit where credit is due moment. And Paul reminds the Philippians there in verse 22, you know that Timothy has proved himself. Paul's not making this up. And the church knew it. Timothy genuinely loved them. He was looking out for their welfare. Timothy lived out what Paul wrote back in Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. Where he do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Folks, that's our example. Our service has to be genuine. We have to have genuine concern for each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and for others, the, the people around us in the world. Paul tells us plainly that this isn't common in the world. He writes in verse 21, For everyone who looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. It's just not enough for us to, to collect and distribute food or to serve meals simply because Jesus said it's our job to take care of those in need. And he did say that. In summary, in Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. We need to have genuine concern for the welfare of others because that's Christ's attitude. Remember back to chapter 2, verse 7, uh, Jesus had taken the very nature of a servant. Jesus came to serve God's plan for the sake of others, for our sake. And we need to have the same genuine attitude. And that happens when we build relationships and, and, and not just programs in the church. Paul and Timothy had a relationship, he writes in verse 22, as a son with his father. And Paul reminded the church that they knew that relationship. They'd witnessed Paul's relationship with Timothy, that Paul was not just the master and Timothy the, the servant, or Paul the teacher and Timothy the disciple, 
but that Paul and Timothy work together in the gospel as father and son. Folks, how, how can we do that? How can we be genuinely concerned for each other if we don't think of each other as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ? Let me be dangerously vulnerable with you about a dark secret in ministry. It's really hard for preachers to have friends in the churches where they minister because the relationship tends to focus on the fact that I'm the employee. Did you know that the average tenure for a minister is about three years? That's because churches are, are typically looking for results from a preacher and not a relationship. And I think that reveals why so many churches struggle with their mission to make disciples because making disciples means building relationships, not just with the preacher, but with the people around us. And those relationships need to be genuine, not just to fill up the building. If we're going to get our minds right about serving, we need to put ourselves in the right position to build genuine relationships. And then we need to do what is necessary. Here's where Paul makes the shift to Epaphroditus and his return to Philippi. Well, Paul seems to be waiting to send Timothy back to Philippi, waiting to see what happens in his own situation. Paul recognized that now was the time to send Epaphroditus back. In verse 25, he writes, I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Now, to be honest, this sounds like a hard decision for Paul. I think it's obvious that Paul had a genuinely deep personal relationship with Epaphroditus. He, he calls him in verse 25, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. They've been through a lot together. Paul obviously cares deeply for Epaphroditus. Paul cares so much for him that he's ready to send him back to Philippi because of Epaphroditus' worry for them. He writes in verse 26, he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. The thing is, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to Paul because Paul needed the help. They sent a gift, probably money, but also Epaphroditus himself to help Paul through his imprisonment. Paul viewed Epaphroditus as a blessing from God. He writes in, in verse 27, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Despite Paul's needs that Epaphroditus was fulfilling, Paul had to make the hard choice and do what was necessary to send Epaphroditus back to the Philippians. And so he writes in verse 20, 28, therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Serving humbly means doing what is necessary, which is not necessarily easy or fun or inexpensive or popular. It's like a lot of things in life, right? You got to eat your vegetables. You got to go to work. You got to go to school. You got to pay the bills. You got to do the exercises. You got to take your medicine. Apple founder Steve Jobs once said, if you want to make people happy, don't be a leader, sell ice cream. I think our leaders know this is true. Just in the last couple of months, our leaders had to make a necessary decision that may have been, or that wasn't very popular. Not because they are, or because they are, truly humble servants. Uh, they're not serving their own wants, desires, uh, but the kingdom and the best interests of others. So when we decided to suspend in-person services, that made some people angry, but others were relieved. And when we decided to meet again in person, that made some people happy, but others still worried. Either way, the decision had to be made. And our humble servant leaders made the necessary decision out of genuine concern for others. And that kind of concern for others leads humble servants to ease suffering. Notice how Epaphroditus eased Paul's suffering. 
Paul writes in, in chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, and you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. As God used Epaphroditus as a humble servant, both Epaphroditus and Paul found their suffering to be lessened. God had mercy on both Epaphroditus and Paul, sparing Paul, he says, sorrow upon sorrow. And when Epaphroditus returned to Philippi, Paul was expecting to have less anxiety. Because of his concern for Paul and for the Philippians, Epaphroditus became a servant who eased their suffering. Wow, look around today. There are a lot of people suffering around us, aren't there? We've got folks among us who are suffering because of their own health problems and and others among us who are suffering because of others' health problems. Between this virus, cancer, dementia, pneumonia, and other debilitating conditions. What could we do? What might you be able to do to help ease their suffering? Visit them, call, write, cook something for them, offer to clean for them. There's also all kinds of people around us uh, suffering in other ways. Again, people suffering uh, with the virus because of the virus. People who are sick and, and people who are losing their jobs. What could we do to ease their suffering? Maybe we could take care of some things that that they can't do. Chores, shopping, cooking. Maybe they need help with their kids. Maybe they need some help with money. or, Or maybe they need some small jobs to get them through. Maybe we just need to follow the community guidelines for for slowing this virus and, and helping the economy as best we can. There are all kinds of people who are suffering because of the growing tension over race and injustice. What could we do to ease their suffering? Well, for many of us, we just probably need to keep quiet and listen to what's going on in their life. We probably ought to be standing up and defending those who are victims of injustice. We need to live justly. And we need to live and preach the gospel. The good news of God's reconciliation of of all people to himself and to other people through Jesus' death and resurrection. Whatever the suffering, whatever the hardship, God's humble servants work to ease the suffering out of genuine concern for others, doing whatever is necessary. We must also honor humble servants. Funny thing is, This is where we find the only two uh, commands in this section of of the text. Philippians 2 verse 29 says, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Here Paul commands the Philippians uh, to welcome Epaphroditus and and to honor others who are like him. I think from this it seems we ought to value humble servants like Timothy and Epaphroditus. We need to welcome them as they work among us and hold them with high regard. Why? Well, that's because that's how God responds to humble servants. Servants whose attitudes are like Jesus. Go back a few verses to Philippians 9, uh, 2, verses 9 through 11. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of, the, of God the Father. When Jesus submitted himself humbly in obedience to God's plan to save us from our sins, Not only did God raise him from the dead, but he raised him to glory in heaven. God's plan was fulfilled through Jesus' humble obedience, and God honored it. God's plan continues to be fulfilled through our humble obedience as servants to the gospel like Paul, like Timothy, and Epaphroditus. And so we must honor that. 
not only by welcoming humble servants, but also by becoming like them. I think this is what the the Philippians had already begun to do. I I think we can see this in Paul's prayer of joy earlier in chapter 1. They were following Paul's example of humble service, and it brought him joy. He writes in Philippians 1, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. As Paul was a humble servant of the gospel, the Philippians became partners in the gospel with Paul. As Paul's humble service in the gospel led him to be in chains, the Philippians shared with him in God's grace. They honored Paul by by taking care of him while he served among them, but they also honored Paul by sending Epaphroditus to help him while he was in prison. Folks, we need to honor God's humble servants, the ones who are among us, our elders, our deacons, our teachers, those who cook and clean and serve in many different ways. We need to honor them because often they're serving in ways that that we can't. Paul mentioned this uh, in the last verse we're looking at, Philippians 2, verse 30, in regard to Epaphroditus' service. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. We honor humble servants because they often bridge the gaps. Paul told the Philippians to to welcome and honor Epaphroditus because he gave Paul the help they couldn't give him. Even though they'd sent Epaphroditus to Paul uh, with a gift to help him, there were ways in which he helped Paul that their gift couldn't help. Epaphroditus bridged the gap between Paul's needs and, and their gift. Now, if I had to guess what Epaphroditus had done to do that, I'd look back to verse 25 when Paul described uh, Epaphroditus as my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. Epaphroditus had gotten involved in Paul's ministry despite his imprisonment. Likely, right there in the work that Paul was describing in chapter 1, verse 7, when he was in chains, defending, confirming the gospel. It's very much like our own work in ministry. While we need to support our ministry work with with financial gifts and offerings, there are some things that, well, money just can't buy. We can't buy, or we can buy the curriculum and other resources that we need to teach a class. But we still need teachers to teach. We can set aside money for missionaries, but we still need people to go and make disciples. We can pay to keep the lights on, uh, to keep the building at the right temperature, but we still need people to lead worship, to teach lessons, to preach sermons, to make disciples. We still need humble servants to bridge the gaps. To be honest, I think that's the heart of what humble servants are called to do, to bridge the gap. Again, our primary example is Jesus. The greatest problem of all human history is the gap that exists between God and mankind that's caused by our own sin. Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In our sin, we stand on one side of the gap, separated from God. But Jesus bridged the gap. Because of God's love for us, Jesus became the perfect, humble servant. He became one of us, taking a genuine interest in our salvation, giving us the opportunity to have a genuine relationship with God. Jesus did what was absolutely necessary. He died on the cross to forgive our sins, and he rose again to give us new life with God. So when we put our faith in Jesus believing that Jesus is God's Son who died for our sins and rose again, repenting from our old sinful life and turning back to God, 
confessing Jesus as Lord, as the master of our life, and joining with him in his death and resurrection by being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, he will save us. Then we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will live in us and help us to live with the right mind in humble service, worshiping and serving God within God's family, the church. Then we can help others to find the same kind of relationship with God. Are you ready? Uh, are, are you ready to take the right position in humble service to God? If you are, or, or if you're ready uh, to talk about the, those things, I'd be glad to talk with you. Uh, just contact me here at Athens Church of Christ, and we'll get together real soon. Until then, would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the perfect example of Jesus. Thank you for the other examples that we have within the church, faithful men and women who've showed us how to serve you, how to serve others with Jesus' humility. Right now, Father, I pray for the church. I, I pray that, that we would give honor where honor is due, first of all, to, to Christ who died for us, but also to those faithful servants who have preached the gospel, who've lived it out so that we might follow their example. God, I also pray for those who've not yet put their faith in Jesus. Help us, uh, the church, help us to, to show them the way. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.